The weekly cybercrime and business podcast is brought to you by Surfwatch Labs. Surfwatch Labs delivers cyber risk intelligence solutions that help organizations understand the potential for cyber attacks, determine the impact to their business, and proactively address threats head on. Hey everyone out there, today is April 17th, 2015. I am Jeff Peters, Hack Surfer Editor. I am here with Matt Leifus, Hack Surfer Writer, and Eric Severson, Surfwatch Labs Data Analyst. Um, a little bit later, after the uh, top headlines and discussion, uh, we have an interview with Mike Buratowski. He's the Vice President of Cybersecurity Services for Fidelis Cybersecurity. They were in the news recently because Marlin Equity Partners has agreed to sign a definitive agreement to acquire the Fidelis cybersecurity solutions from General Dynamics, and that's expected to close in quarter two of 2015. But we talked uh, with Mike about uh, Pushdo, which was once considered the second largest botnet in existence. At its peak, it sent 7.7 billion emails a day. But they're kind of observed it coming back. Uh, They found it in more than 50 countries with a substantial infection rate in the Asia-Pacific region. So we just kind of chat about that comeback and a few other cybersecurity issues. But yeah, I guess we'll throw it over to you, Matt, for some of the top cyber headlines from last week. Yeah, we'll go through a rundown of the top three. Uh, So coming at number three this week, we had Homebridge. This is a California-based home care services company. And this week they notified an unknown number of past and present employees about a data breach into their human resource records. The company fears that cyber criminals are using the information to file fraudulent tax returns, and some of this information included names, addresses, and social security numbers. Coming in at number two this week, we had, and I might be saying this wrong, guys, it's a, it's a Belgium-based company, but uh, Rossell and Sai, again, this is a Belgium-based media group, and they were hit with a cyber attack this week, which left several of their websites uh, unavailable for a few hours. Their most popular paper, La Soie, was among the targets. Um, As of right now, the websites are all back up and running normally. And the number one new trending target this week was Marriott International. White Lodging Services Corporation, which is an Indiana-based management company for Marriott International, reported a point-of-sale breach in their food and beverage system outlets that compromised 10 separate hotels managed by this uh, management company. Um, The breach lasted for seven months, starting in July of 2014 and ending in February of 2015. The information that was compromised, again, point of sale, so you're talking uh, credit card information. So that was the top news this week. What are we going to discuss this week, guys? I guess the big news that uh, all the, you know, sort of cyber media outlets are writing about is the new Verizon data breach investigation report, sort of the uh, the holy grail of cybercrime reports that comes out every year. Um, so I thought I'd just kind of run down a few of the, the highlights from there. You know, it's a big 70-page report, so if anyone wants to read it, highly recommended. We'll put the uh, the link in the podcast description for those that are interested But in total, the Verizon report looks at 79,790 security incidents and 2,122 confirmed data breaches from 2014. So there's quite a bit of information in there. And just a couple of like the big picture highlights in terms of like malware and practices. Over the last couple of years, key logging malware has has gone down. Last year, it was only at about 5% of the confirmed breaches. And RAM scraper malware is sort of the big one that's been trending up, and that was involved in a lot of the the high-profile retail breaches in, from last year. Um, and then there's a couple other uh, interesting things in there that, at least to me, like in terms of phishing, that seems to be the the number that everyone seems to be kind of writing about is this uh, the median time for a phishing campaign to get its first click is one minute and 22 seconds. So everyone's writing all these headlines about it. It only takes a minute and a half, you know, for for a breach kind of to start. But actually, the, the percent of people that click is, has actually gone up. It said that 23% of recipients now open phishing mes- messages and 11% click on attachments. So I thought that was a pretty high number. 
And then one other thing that stood out to me was there had a section on vulnerabilities, and it said that 10 CVEs account for almost 97% of the exploits observed in 2014. So obviously, you know, you got to prioritize, you know, what you're patching. And then, you know, just kind of a, a little tip from there, it says, you know, based on the data, uh, it strongly suggests that a patch deployment strategy focusing on coverage and consistency is far more effective at preventing data breaches than fire drills attempting to patch particular systems as soon as patches are released. Um, so that's kind of uh, just some highlights from that report. And if you're interested, well, like I said, we'll put the link in the description. Like you said, there was a lot in the uh, Verizon report. I thought one of the interesting things was their assessment that Android malware, malware, which we're starting to hear a lot about, was kind of an overblown risk. They said it's less than 1% of all these problems, and they uh, don't see it as the big boogeyman that a lot of companies are making it out to be. Also, I'm part of those 23% of recipients who often open the phishing messages, but I do that more for learning purposes. I know what they are. I can tell pretty quickly. I would advise staying out of your spam folder if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, and on that point, you know, when I see recently, and I got a interview, a Q&A article coming out next week, I talked to a gentleman about an approach to cybersecurity. Essentially, his company goes in and trains people. They offer training on what to look for with a lot of these threats. And obviously one of the big ones are phishing emails. And it, it, it kind of surprises me that with everything that's happened, you know, I mean, cybersecurity is really starting to become, you know, a pretty big focus among companies and people are learning more about it every day that a number like 11% of people are still clicking on those attachments that, you know, like you said, Jeff, that that's a pretty big number. I'm really surprised. I think a lot of companies that are aiming to try to educate people and companies and their employees about, you know, how to handle some of this malicious content or, you know, simply just not clicking on it. I really think they got their work cut out for them because it just seems like every study we see, we see these big numbers like that. It just, that's what probably stood out to me the most. Yeah, and for those interested in uh, more about phishing, I actually interviewed a vendor uh, yesterday, and we're going to have them on next Friday's podcast. They're releasing a report, a pretty de detailed report about phishing and phishing attacks. So if you're interested in learning more about phishing, uh, that should be on uh, next week's episode that we have. The Verizon report was one of the big things, but uh, I guess, Matt, was there anything else that stood out to you this week? There were, there were a couple, but I, I want to start off with the entertainment sector. In the month of March, if people were able to see it, Surfwatch Labs, every the beginning of the month is uh, Industry Report Card Week, and Surfwatch Labs released several report cards, one on the entertainment sector, and the, the sector as a whole received a B-plus grade, which, you know, for risk assessment and things like that, they, you know, it's pretty good. That's a significant decrease in risk for the month. And it's an accurate grade. We, we have the opportunity to look at all the data. And, you know, month by month, targets in, in this sector were disappearing and non-existent. Well, April has been a little bit different. Uh, there have been several entertainment targets. The ball kind of got rolling this year on the annual Op Israel attacks that accounted for several targets. Kendall Jenner's Twitter account got hacked more celebrity nude photos from uh, Kelly Brook that got released. This is the second time for her. Uh, even NFL players are getting on the action. Dale Revis is claiming his Instagram was hacked, but some people are kind of denying that. They're kind of saying that he's just trying to cover up for something he said. But on top of that, there were a lot of newspapers this month so far that have also been in the news. The most recent attack on the newspaper side were the attack on this French TV contacts computer where 100,000 contacts were stolen. After that, we had, as we said earlier, Rossell and Cy with the La Soie newspaper. Then there was the uh, French news broadcast of TV5 Mundi, which was actually attacked by Cyber Caliphate, which is a uh, ISIS-supporting Muslim-type group. So a lot of going on in this sector, a lot of targets that have just randomly appeared this month. Occasionally, some of the celebrity stuff is connected to some big deals like, uh, you know, the Sony hack. I don't think most business people care about, like, 
Twitter hacking or whatever, but this uh, TV5 Monde in French was kind of a big deal. They took the entire TV broadcast off the air for a while. That's a capability we haven't really seen very much, and to just eliminate broadcasting ability for a period of the day is pretty significant. If that hits some of the major U.S. channels, uh, people would be throwing a fit. So I think that's a interesting event and a capability to watch out for, see if that uh, becomes a thing in the future. Another thing everyone was talking about with that TV station was when they went offline, they were doing an interview about it on another French TV station, and it turns out they had uh, all their social media accounts and information and passwords on post-it notes right behind them in the shot. That was just kind of amusing to me. I mean, maybe not necessarily so important, but it gave me a little bit of a chuckle. But obviously some overall security problems at that station. You're just a culture fan. <laughs> There was a few sort of regulatory items in the news this week. Target and MasterCard reached a settlement in regards to the uh, the massive Target breach from 2013. Target is going to pay $19 million to MasterCard. So that settlement does not include financial institutions that issue Visa-branded cards. There's going to be a separate negotiation for that. But, you know, Target was also, I think it was last month that they had the, the $10 million settlement in regards to the uh, actual victims, the individual consumers of the breach. Uh, but yeah, looking at the total cost to, to banks and credit unions, it says, uh, this is actually a 2014 article, but I think the numbers are pretty up to date. It says that the Consumers Bankers Association said that its members have incurred a total cost related to card replacements of $172 million just from that breach. And the Credit Union National Association believes the cost to its members is $30.6 million. Like you said, this is kind of a partial settlement. Uh, a lot of people are actually kind of upset about this because these banks were doing sort of a class action lawsuit against Target, and now Target's sort of picking them off individually by card providers. So they say they're kind of trying to do an end run around the class action thing. So. It'll be interesting to see if this is accepted and what they offer to other banks and the other card providers. And still, obviously, a lot of costs for Target, but they seem to be, based on those numbers you were citing, getting away with fairly good deals on these settlements. But I guess the banks are just happy to get some of their costs deep, right? Uh, one other um, fine that was in the news recently was PG&E. Um, they were fined $1.6 billion. I believe it was 10 times larger than the previous largest fine by the California Public Utilities Commission. But that fine was in regards to their 2010 natural gas pipeline explosion. And that one actually uh, killed eight people, injured many others, and destroyed 38 homes in the area. Um, that's not entirely cybersecurity related. It was... The explosion was brought up, brought about by a defective seam weld, but the the NTSB's report found that PG&E's SCADA systems um, limitations caused delays in pinpointing the location of the break, and it ended up taking 95 minutes uh, to stop the flow of gas um, during that 2010 explosion. So obviously that made the effects much worse. When it comes to SCADA, everyone always talks about you know hacking and things like that, but there are other you know SCADA related issues that can lead to, in this case, you know, people getting killed and homes getting destroyed. Um, so, yeah, they were fined $1.6 billion over that, which is a pretty significant fine. So moving on, we got the cyber tip of the week. I was looking at the Verizon report earlier, and um, they said that in this year's data set, they found that nearly 70% of attacks where a motive for attack was known include a secondary victim. So this would be, you know, like a watering hole attack, for example, where a website's compromised, but the target is, you know, not the website itself. So I thought that was interesting just because, you know, obviously, especially with small businesses, you know, you still hear that no one's going to really come after me. But, it's, you know, it turns out that, you know, 70% of the times there's sort of these secondary victims that are caught in the crossfire. So just something to keep in mind, especially in regards to your supply chain and things like that. Yeah, so moving on, we have an interview with 
Mike Buratowski. He is the Vice President of Cybersecurity Services for Fidelis Cybersecurity. And we talk about the Pushdo botnet, phishing, and other cyber trends. I know you guys just released some research on the uh, Pushdo botnet. Um, which was once considered the second largest in the world, and you guys have said that it's resurfaced with uh, infections in more than 50 countries. So I just wondering if you could maybe fill us in a little bit about, about your research. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as you'd say, it, it's been around for a long time, and it was you know very much associated with various the sandbox and other types of activity, and now it's uh, still around, and you know we did some pretty significant research on the domain generation algorithm, the QGA, uh, and you're providing that information out to the community so that they can help defend themselves from that. We also see Pushdo being able to push uh, a variety of secondary payloads with uh, some pretty pretty nasty stuff like boots and uh, dire, you know, that can be used for uh, DDoS attacks and uh, credential theft. Um, yeah, and I believe you guys said it was mainly the sort of Asia Pacific region that was uh, being infected. Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's definitely still worldwide. But when you look at at the areas that are are getting really really significant amounts of it, uh, there's a, a pretty good correlation between you know the Asia Pac area and you know we extrapolate that out with being associated with systems that pirated software. A little bit of, of again extrapolation and an assumption on our part, but you know since it's been around so long, it, you know you would assume that systems would be patched for it. But using pirated software, you obviously can't keep your system patched and whatnot. So uh, it has a little bit of an easier time infecting those types of systems. Yeah, one thing I wanted to ask you about is we see in the news all the time, you know, these uh, botnets sort of getting taken down, and, you know, this one in the past has sort of kind of had a little back and forth, and then it resurfaces. You know, from someone who's kind of a little more on the outside of the, the cybersecurity world like myself, I wonder if you could maybe explain sort of that, because it seems like, you know, you always hear about these botnets getting taken down, but then, you know, a year later or whatever, it seems like they're back. Yeah, I mean, un- unfortunately, that, that does seem to be the way it is, and 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 you have to look at it this way, you know, the, the bad guys are really using, you know, one methodology to get in. Their motivations still fit to be able to conduct the, the nefarious activities that they're trying to do. So even though you take down one vector or one methodology, you know, they'll find a, another way to set it up, you know, to attack or set up the infrastructure that they need. You know, it, it's the sort of thing when you look at, at everything that's out there to help stop malware, you know, but at the end of the day, there's still always those unknown vectors of attack, you know, zero days are called that because people haven't found them yet. So it, it's a little bit of a battle of you're fighting against something that you don't know. It's always dangerous when you don't know how much you don't know. <laughs> I've read a few reports, you know, in the last couple of days and a couple of different people I've talked to, they've just sort of said that kind of like mass spam and mass phishing is sort of on the, the decline overall in favor of, you know, like more targeted kind of methods. Um, I mean, obviously spam and phishing still works, but I'm just wondering if you uh, agree with that kind of sentiment that I'm hearing. Yeah, I, I absolutely would. I think, you know, spear phishing and very targeted uh, attacking it, it is more prevalent these days. It, it's a better return on investment and really being able to collect the information you need to uh, profile your your potential target. It just becomes more and more easy when you look at all the information that's out there on the internet. It's not hard to track somebody down and find out their position and and really look at if they would be a good valuable target to go after. And then you know it it still exists today that at at the end of uh, the day the weakest link is always human element and having good protection really involve everybody. Everybody has to buy into the understanding that there are people trying to get the information you have or trying to get on the systems that you have access to. And, you know, once people start having that little bit of suspicion in their mind, it'll lead to, you know, a better security posture. 
Yeah, kind of going off of that, I was looking at the the recent Verizon report that just came out, and they had a little bit on phishing in there, and they said that among email users who receive phishing bait messages, 23% of them now open those phishing messages, and 11% click. I thought that was pretty high to know that 11% of people are clicking on these. Um, I don't know if you agree with that, but it just seems like there's this constant talk about how we need to train people on phishing. But then you look at numbers like that, and it seems yeah. like you wonder if we're getting anywhere with that. No, I, I couldn't agree more with it. And, and, and the bad guys are getting really good at this. So they're, they're, you know, you're not dealing with the old mass phishing attempts where they're trying to, you know, they're, they email you and say, hey, I've got this account. I have to get this money offshore, and, and I'll share it with you. You know, now they're, they're really targeting the message and, and the actual uh, phishing email. So an example that I like to tell people about, when a business development person for a company gets an email you know, requesting a uh, proposal, you know, that's their job. Their job is to open that email and actually look at the PDF document or the Word document that's attached there. That, you know, that's their nature. So it's very hard to get them to, get, to look at it and, and say, well, you know what, there's some spelling that's off here. The grammar doesn't seem quite right. You know, let me look at this or let me make sure that, uh, you know, I scan the document before I open it. So it's a constant battle. You know, the bad guy is always up in his game and, and having folks understand that, uh, you know, they are targeted. It, it's a challenge. Kind of going a little more big picture. Um, I'm just kind of curious to know, you know, what type of companies, you know, that Fidelis deals with and maybe like what are some of the common, you know, cybercrime or cybersecurity issues that, that they're dealing with at the moment? Well, so we deal with pretty much uh, any commercial entity. Uh, most of our clients fall into the Fortune uh, World, or the Worldwide 2500, but we have done engagements and have customers from very small businesses all the way up to some of the biggest companies in the world. As far as trends, what I see, you know, I've also noticed an uptick recently in ransomware. That seems to be a decent moneymaker for the bad guys. And still, again, is another way for, for folks to, for the bad guys to generate revenue, but still target the human element. You know, it's kind of interesting to see the, the bad guys run that as a, you know, almost as a legitimate business, you know, because if, if they were, didn't give, you know, give back the keys or get back the encryption key for the data, then nobody would be incentivized to actually pay the ransom. And, you know, it's just kind of intriguing that the, the criminal element is, you know, running as a pseudo, you know, business. Yeah, one thing I wanted to ask you about, on the last couple of podcasts, there was, uh, I guess, a lot of news about sort of like hacktivists and sort of ideological hackers. You know, there was Op Israel recently and all these ISIS defacements everyone's reporting on all over the world. So it seems like everyone's talking about that in the media. But I'm wondering, I don't know if like the businesses you deal with, I'm just wondering, like, do they actually care about that? Because it seems like although everyone's talking about it, it's mainly just kind of like the low-hanging fruit that's getting defaced or DDoSed. So yeah, I'm just kind of curious how much like the actual businesses themselves pay attention to you know stuff like Israel, for example. I, I I absolutely think they pay attention to it. You look at you know probably the most recent and highest profile was the the Sony breach, and when you look at that, you know that had a very very significant impact. And while it may not have you know they may not have done that breach for stealing information or money. You know, they did it to make a ideological point. And I, I really think they're going to see that going forward because when you look at doing something like that, the return on investment for the attacker is so high. You know, it doesn't take a lot of investment. You know, you need your computer, you need an internet connection, and you need some, some expertise uh, to be able to do some pretty significant damage. The other reason why I think you're going to see continued activities like that is because, just as you said, it does, you know everybody talks about it, but it doesn't seem like it comes being done about it. And I think that is traditional when you look at cybercrime. You know, people aren't dying, that you know, in these situations. 
So, you know, you look at the the response, it's not as severe as, as if somebody had done a kinetic attack and, you know, uh, set off a bomb or something. But it still gets the, the notoriety and the attention. So, so again, they're, you know, it's good return on investment with relatively low risk of, of repercussion on the bad guy. So I, I absolutely think you're going to see that continue going forward. Yeah, and then I guess, you know, last year everyone was calling, you know, the year of the retail breach or the year of the mega vulnerabilities. Um, it seems like this year so far, um, if you had to sort of put a catchphrase on it, it would be like the year of insurance breaches. Um, there's just been so many recently with Anthem and, you know, other ones. Just looking at the year so far, is there any sort of thoughts that come into your mind, you know, about trends? I mean, I know you mentioned ransomware, but is there anything else that maybe sticks out in your mind? Well, you know, I, I think you're going to see other theft of, of personal information. So, you know, the insurance company, when you look at the richness of the data that a bad guy can steal from a company like that, it, it's really quite profound. When you're looking at a retail breach, you know, yeah, you're grabbing, a, you know, individual's credit card information, name, you know, if you're lucky, you might get a social security number. When you look at items that are being stolen from insured or uh, you know, from medical facility and such that, that retain or keep a hold of people's full medical profile. I mean, you can really do a, a full identity theft on that, you know, because you have everything you, you need there and you can just put together such an unbelievably detailed profile. So you will, you'll see that absolutely grow. All right, that's it for this week's Cybercrime and Business Podcast. As always, you can follow us on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever else you listen. And for more information, check out surfwatchlabs.com.